All right, good morning. It is Saturday morning, and this is the Notary Nerds Book Club. I'm so glad that you're here. We are reading a phenomenal book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And this book basically is a must read, if you ask me. I'm just like, you know, if you haven't read this book, you need to. And not only do you need to read it once, you probably need to kind of study it, maybe read it several times. This is going to be my second time reading it. And I'm learning things that I did not know in the first one. We were supposed to read chapters 10 through 15 because your fearless leader thought we could. Well, your fearless leader fell short and was only able to get through chapter 13 because the chapter on sex was super long. I didn't realize it was so long. And it, is, it was so long because as we read, we saw how important it was to the overall achievements of goals and things like that. So I can't wait to um, get into that discussion. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna save chapters 14 through 15, which are the last two chapters of the book for next Saturday. And those are pretty deep. So it's cool that we'll leave them on their own, okay? So we're, we'll get started chapter 10. And I'd like to let anybody who has something that popped out at them, give us, start us off. Does anybody have anything that they want to, um, that they got out of chapter 10 that they'd like to start the discussion off with? I can start with this uh, statement okay. from the very first page. I won't read the whole statement, but it talks about power, which I thought was really interesting. It says that power as the term that the way that it's used here is an organized effort. And that's not usually how you think of what you think when you think of the word power. Right, 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 right. That is so true. It, it, this, it keeps telling, it keeps telling my mind that the more like-minded people that you have together, the, the more likely you are to be able to achieve your goals. And it's clear to me that this is not a solo pursuit. You can't do any of these big, huge accomplishments by yourself. No one in the history of mankind has been able to do that. So why would we think that we can set out and go it alone and, and achieve all these big things? That's not how, that's not how life is, God didn't make it that way. <laughs> He put us all here so that we could kind of figure out how to work together. And if we figure that out, we can accomplish so many more things than we could if we were just doing it on our own. Um, that is something that definitely stood out to me too, Kia. And it is required for the accumulation of money. So if you know that you want, if you have this, you're trying to develop this money consciousness, right? And you know you want this amount of money, whatever that amount is that you decided that you want then you know you're going to need power to do that. And in order to obtain power, you have to work well with others in the sandbox, right? You can't be in the sandbox by yourself, digging up the sand and building your little castle, okay? Number one is gonna take forever. Number two is just not how it works. You have to invite other people into your sandbox, but you, can, you have to really screen and make sure that those people don't come with them. Some of the, that, the fears and the things that, you know, will be negative in keeping you from doing what you need to do. Um, he talks about infinite intelligence. Did you guys pick up, um, let me see here. The source of knowledge may be con contacted through the produce. Infinite intelligence, it kind of, and that whole creative thing, I, I had to kind of read over that twice because I kind of kept getting them mixed up in my head. Infinite intelligence is the source of knowledge may be, this source of knowledge may be contacted through the procedure described in another chapter with the aid of creative imagination. Because we talked about in the last chapter, creative imagination and um, the other kind that doesn't, what was the name of the other one? Hold on. Let me go back and see now. I've got to go find it. There were two types of imagination and the creative one is the one that you want to use. There we go. Let me see, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. I should have I uh, highlighted this, but I didn't. And I may come back to it because I can't, I can't find it right off. Okay, never mind. Okay, wait a minute, is this it? Uh, no. No, 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 no. Okay, I'll come back to that when, it, when, it, when I can easily find it. But anyway, so let's keep going. Um, accumulated experience. So yeah, so things that you've gone through in your past, they, they are only the beginnings of what affects your subconscious. Really what affects it is when your brain, he talks about being stimulated and he talks about stimulation in a couple of different ways from, um, you know, 
things that we put in our bodies that kind of help stimulate our brain, um, that have the effect of stimulating our brain, but some of those things can also have a negative effect too. He points out that some of the people that we, um, like Ed Edgar Allan Poe, for instance, um, wrote The Raven in a full drunken stupor, right? Because alcohol is one of those things that causes our brain to, to do other things. And in that state, he wrote, the, he wrote that poem, which is one of the most famous poems in the, in, the, in the history of poetry. So there are things that we can do to stimulate our brain, but we have to manage that with those, you know, making sure those things don't have that negative uh, effect. Um, Henry Ford began his business career under the handicap of poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance, okay? So he is using Henry Ford and his creation of, of the mastermind that Henry Ford put around him as an example that it doesn't really matter what you start with, what you know and what you don't know. If you have the foresaw, forethought of mind to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, which requires you to put your ego in check a little bit, and sometimes that's, that's difficult for, for us to do, um, but if you can do that, because he didn't have a good start, Henry Ford, okay? But here we are in 2020 talking about who? Henry Ford. We can drive down most main streets and see a Ford dealership, right? That is because of Henry Ford, this person who came from poverty, didn't have the greatest intellect or whatever, but he knew enough to know that if he, if he surrounded himself with other people um, that had strengths that he didn't have, that he was going to be okay. Um, let's, talk, let's go around the room real quick and discuss ways in which we have or are planning to incorporate other people into our business so that we can achieve the goals that we want to achieve. Uh, who wants to go first? Anybody? Well, I will, okay? I have this, <laughs> I have this huge plan for Notary Nerd University that involves reaching out um, to different states to see about um, developing continuing education, right? Classes for notaries. And many states don't have a continuing, well, I don't think any state has a continuing education program. And so in order for me to do that, I'm gonna have to partner with people way smarter than myself to be able to not only educate those notaries in those states uh, uh, with that state specific information, um, but also the technical people that would need to be available to me to be able to get the website up and running and all of the you know, administrative people that would need to be a, a, a part of the team in order to make sure things were moving smoothly and, and, and customer service issues are, are handled in a timely manner. So I cannot alone do all of that, okay? So I am already starting to communicate with people and talk to different people about this plan. I, this is the second time I've talked about it. I talked about it to two people already, or maybe three, or maybe four. But now I'm talking about it more um, because I now have a solidified plan in my mind that came as an idea from reading this book last week. It popped, it just popped in my head. So that's kind of one of the ways that I'm using um, what I'm learning in this book to create a mastermind. So who wants to go next? Anybody else? Go ahead, Hilda. You can come up um, mute. There we go. My sister started as a notary like five years ago, and I just came on board this year. And by reading this book and reading um, the groups, getting into the notary groups, it's, there's just like so much stuff from the notary general work. And so now I'm starting to collaborate with her, and she's a bookkeeping as well. And I'm like, there's so much thing out there that we can do. Exactly. So hopefully... I'll we can collaborate together. Very good. Start yeah, together. I, exactly. I love that approach because you're already aware that, hey, you're starting to see, wait a minute, this thing can be pretty vast. There's so many different ways, especially when you start exploring general notary work to pursue the business and to build your business's model. And then you already have said, okay, well, my sister's doing this and she's also a bookkeeper. And these are the beginning thoughts that you're having. And eventually, if you keep on meditating on them, you're gonna come up with a plan and it's gonna hit you like, oh, wow, this is what we need to do. We need to do this, this, and this. And then you'll start to formulate it. And I think that's really good that you're thinking that way. So thanks for sharing that with us. Anybody else? I'll go. Good morning, hey, this is Lisa. Hey, um, I was in the beginning, I was really close-minded and I was like, well, nobody can be a notary but me, and somebody was gonna take the work away from me. But the more I think about it, uh, 
I guess it was a book. I was something saying mm-hmm. <laughs> that it's enough work to include other people. So my mom is semi-retired <clears throat> and I want to generate income so that she doesn't have to worry about retirement and that kind of stuff. So I'm trying to figure out what, and she doesn't move around as well as I do. So I'm trying to figure out what can we do to try to incorporate her into the business so that hmm. it'll be enough income for everybody in the family. I love that. I love that. Hey, Damien, good morning. Good morning. I, I love that, Narisa. Yeah, my mom is getting ready to come out of the classroom. She's a teacher in the Memphis City Schools. And this is this June is her last, you know, spring. And I'm like you trying to figure out how to help her. She's thinking about retirement and making sure she's going to have enough on the fixed income to be able um, to maintain her lifestyle. So, you know, I introduced the whole notary thing to her and she's kind of sort of, you know, interested in it, but she would much rather be at her sewing machine making stuff like she makes stuff, just stuff. Right. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's the beginning of it is letting go of the idea that number one, I can do it by myself. And then number two, who can I, and I like the way you did it, Narisa. You look to someone just like with Hilda that you could trust. In Hilda's case, it's her sister. And in your case, it's your mom. That's a real key to the whole mastermind philosophy. You don't want to bring any unharmoniousness into your mastermind. If there's conflict or there's issues with that individual, they would probably be better suited to not be in your mastermind. Maybe they can remain as an associate, but if they've got some qualities that you're not going to be able to help, uh, that's not going to be, you know, conducive to what you got going on, leave them where they at, okay? And I know that was improper English, but that was done in order to drive the point home. Um, Gandhi, anybody else wanna share uh, ways that they're gonna be collaborating with others in the future before we move forward? Monica, I'll just say this quickly. So I'm still trying to figure out my business model because I have different branches flowing out of my business model. And notary, the notary piece is one piece of my business model. I'm also looking at who to, um, who to put as a part of the mastermind team, I have been thinking about people and I actually reached out to um, through a random conversation, my old boss, we were talking about something else because she does a lot of different things other than work for the same place that I do. And we were talking, I was talking to her about this probably a month ago and she was like, she's looking at doing it. Um, so that's kind of where I am in terms of look, thinking about people, figuring out what um, branches are part of my business model, if that makes sense to you. Nice, yeah. I like the way you reach back to an old boss. Sometimes that's hard to do, right? Unless well, you well know. we're friends. So I we just you. had a unique relationship, even when she was my boss. Gotcha. And so she's no longer my boss, but we were just having a random conversation. And I started telling her about notary, notary work and what I do in detail. Because she's the one that that um, asked about me being a notary for my job. Uh, oh. <laughs> in the first place. It's yeah. Like a full circle. I love when and that she, um, what she and her husband do, they buy property and they have, um, they have Airbnbs. Nice. That, yeah. That right there. Interesting. Because you know, and they're in Nashville, right? He's in Smyrna. Smyrna. Well, parts of Nashville, they're, they live in Smyrna, but yeah, different parts of Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know the Airbnb, the short-term rental stuff is, the laws have changed in Nashville a lot. So yep. it's good that you reached out. That's really good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Vanessa's got her hand up. I just have a question. I'm just wondering if anybody has ran into, like, you know, you, there are certain people that you would love to have in your group, but they don't think that they're good enough to be there, but you can see the potential in them. Like, what do you do about that? Oh, wow. That is such a good statement, question and topic. Um, Anybody want to take it? I, I, I have some. I have something to say about that. Can I just can I give an opinion? This is sure. just my opinion, just based off of what we've been reading in the book about the um, the things that kind of destroy your mental state. I would say at this stage, Vanessa, I would say no because we just read. And I think it was like the chapters that we read this time and even previous chapters, we just read that long list of things that can destroy you from being successful. And I think them not thinking that they're good enough to be a part of your mastermind team is one of the things that could destroy you from being successful. Not, I don't want to sound cold because I certainly don't mean it that way. I just think that um, maybe it's not time yet. That's my opinion. 
You know, that makes that makes total sense. Yeah. And I would because they have to see it for themselves. Yes. Uh, One of the one of the dangers, especially we as women have and probably some men, but really women is when we see someone's potential. Oh, my goodness. We're going to help them figure it out. And all they need to do is do what we tell them to do. And we just believe in them. And we're going to 15 years later. Right. So we have to really be careful when someone doesn't see their own potential, maybe gift them this. And if they pick it up and do something with it, great. But you don't want to slow your train down, dragging somebody along who doesn't even believe that they can. Because that thought, that, that, that mindset will seep its way over to you from what he's described, describing when it comes to energy and brain thoughts. All of, these, all of these things are interconnected. And that's why I think sometimes when you get in the presence of someone who is extremely negative, it, you can kind of feel it a little bit. They kind of drain you a little bit. So you really have to kind of be very protective of who you allow into your senses, your sight, your hearing, your all of these things, because whatever they have with them comes, can, can kind of, because we're there's only two things. What did he say on the planet? The planet is made of two things, I think, matter and what else? There's only two when it comes down to it, there's only two things that this whole situation is made out of, and that's matter and energy. That's it. So when you create those things, you get us and leaves and plants and dirt and rocks and all these different things. But there, when you go down to the basics of everything, and so we're all connected and, you know, we're not physically connected, but this thing that we can't see, kind of how we can hear what comes off of the radio that person's wherever they are, but those radio waves transmit through the air. Nobody knows exactly how that happens, but we can hear it on our radio when it happens. But that's the same way that energy from one person to another kind of seeps into us. And we want to really protect ourselves from that. Um, So I agree with Kia. I think that you're on a journey, obviously, of betterment, and you want to make sure that people who don't yet believe in themselves, you encourage them, but you don't necessarily include them in your mastermind. Let's talk about Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, he, the author talks about him being the most powerful man now living. And the reason he was powerful is because he got millions of people to do what he said. And anybody who has kids, anybody who has pets, anybody who is a manager or a supervisor or any kind of, or even in the workplace, do you know how hard it is to get two or three people to, to go the right direction and do the right, even in our Facebook group, you know, we've saw, we saw this a couple of days ago in the Facebook group where, you know, I'm scrolling through and I'm thinking this is WWE. You're like, what, what, what is happening? You know what I mean? Like, I put the thing there saying, everybody be nice. And so all of us are nerds. So I know we all know how to read, be nice, right? But for some reason, it's, it's hard to get everybody to, to follow in that whole thing. So the fact that Gandhi was able to get millions of people, not by force, but just by influence to do what he, do what he wanted them to do or to believe what he wanted them to believe is why the author says he was the pow- most powerful man on the planet at the time. So it, it's, it's one of those things where I don't know how he did it. I, I'm not even going to begin to kind of speculate as to how that happened. But that just goes to show you the power of the mind, right? The power of the mind to influence others. That's so very important. Um, he says here on the top of my page 162 um, that the, actually the bottom, it's a well-known fact of 161. It's a well-known fact that a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. It is also a well-known fact that an individual battery will provide energy in proportion to the number and capacity of the cell it contains. So the individual battery, my brain as an individual brain, Aaron's brain, he'll, we, our brains are only can only do so much output by ourselves. But if I connect my brain with Aaron's and Hilda's and Vanessa's and Candace's and Narisa's and Damien and Kia's, whoa, buddy, whoa, buddy, we're about to do some, we're about to do some stuff. We don't even know what we're about to do. We're about to do some stuff because the collective intelligence from our experiences coupled with that creative intelligence that we tap into, if we allow ourselves to, of those eight people would be, there's no telling what we would come up with if we sat in a room for a couple of hours and figured out 
what we needed to figure out. Um, so he says the brain functions in a similar fashion. And this is on 162 for me. This accounts for the fact that some brains are, are more efficient than others. And we just bless those that have low functioning brains. Y'all don't be mean. And leads this to significant to leads to this significant statement. A group of brains coordinated or connected in a spirit of harmony will provide more thought energy than a single brain, just as a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. This is the mastermind. This is the this is it. So for those of us who have been really solo dolo minded um, and are slowly coming out of that shell of thinking that it's just us and we want all, hey, if we're gonna do the work, we want all the bit, all the glory of it. This, this statement alone should make you realize, hey, if, if, if more batteries um, can put out more power then obviously more people harmoniously put together can put out more power. So, and you have to have power in order to accumulate riches. All right, so I think that's about it. Oh, I love this statement he made. Money is, a, is as shy and elusive as the old time maiden. It must be wooed and won by methods not unlike those used by a determined lover. You can't <laughs> make money come to you. Just like you can't make someone fall in love with you, right? You cannot. You have to woo money. You have to, you have to attract it to you in a way that is conducive for it happening. If you are in a mindset that, yeah, if you're like me and you can sell anything, sometimes you sell yourself bad ideas, okay? Um, sometimes you can convince yourself, yeah, I can do the thing, but in that same thought of thinking you can do the thing, you will sell yourself on, you really can't, right? Like for instance, when I set out to put the number on my, um, right now the number of money that I desired, I put 2.5 million. And this was back in 2019 when I was reading this book for the first time with my son. Well, as I shared in the last discussion, when I wrote that 2.5 million, I really didn't think I could do it. I mean, I wrote it down because I was all hyped up from having read the book and, oh, I can do it. Ah, da, 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 da. And I'm going to write it down, but really, I didn't really believe it, right? So you have to really be careful that you check yourself, especially those of us who are really good at selling ourselves on stuff, because you can put up a good front of confidence and that you can do a thing. But really on the inside, there's a part of you that's also talking and that's that subconscious stuff that we're about to talk about here. Your subconscious mind is, is not to be tricked. You can't trick it if you try. So when you put down, and when I put down 2.5 million, my subconscious was like, whatever and sat back because it was like, you know, it knew. And, 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 and so I'm coming to that now. And that's why you have to keep doing this. You have to keep feeding yourself over and over again in order to get it to happen. Po poverty and riches often change places. Um, that's a, that's a, he used the analogy of the stream. Um, he says, when money comes uh, in quantities known as the big money, it flows to the one who accumulates it as easily as water flows downhill. There exists great uh, an, a great unseen stream of power, which may be compared to a river, except that one side flows in one direction, carrying all who get into that side of the stream onward and upward to wealth. And the other side flows in the opposite direction, carry all who are unfortunate enough to get into it and not able to extract themselves from it. And that may be that person that you were talking about, Vanessa. Um, uh, let's see here. And downward to misery and poverty. So you can't, you know, the only way you get out of that poverty, poverty stream is to extract yourself from it. And that takes effort. That takes your energy to do that. You're going to have to start thinking differently, moving differently, putting different things in your life. And if you don't, poverty will just, if that stream will just carry you down into it and you'll just be there. So there are people that live life that way that, oh, well, this is my station in life. I'm just going to flow, go with the flow. Watch those people because we have read that that flow is that stream of poverty and it's going to flow you for sure. But the only way you get to the stream that leads you to wealth is you have to physically engage in some type of energetic activity, meditating, thinking, reading, exercising, all of these different things pull you out of that 
so that your creative mind can give you those ideas and show you the people that you need to be surrounded by in order to be able to go towards that well. Erin says, I'm looking forward to getting into this um, book and the next meeting. Okay, she's gotta go. Okay, awesome, Erin, thank you for popping in. All right, so let's keep on to the next chapter. Ooh, child, the mystery of sex transmutation. Now, we all know about sex, right? And when I read this book the first time, honestly, it was kind of awkward because we were, my son, my, my oldest son and I were reading it together. And we got to this chapter and I was like, oh gosh, how are we gonna do it? What? what? We kind of didn't discuss this chapter. I, 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 you know, we just, I let him read it. I'm like, okay, did you read chapter 11? He was like, yeah, okay, great. Well, this chapter is <laughs> probably one of the most important ones, right? Because as he mentions, as the author mentions, Sexual energy is gonna really be the biggest energy of them all to direct us. And, 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 and that's just because of how we're made, right? And when we hear sexual energy, we automatically think of the physical aspect of it. But he talks about the, the sexual energy, once you figure out how to control it, can be utilized to take you to great places, right? To feed those desires and thoughts and those ideas and to, to, to propel them along the path towards your great wealth. However, he mentions that most people don't, and he talks in terms of men, he talks um, that most men don't realize that they have the ability to control their sexual desires until they hit the 40s or the 50s. Um, anybody pick up anything out of that, that they wanted to share from having read this chapter? I'll just add this point, Monica. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes complete sense. So aside from the actual act of having sex, think about how you feel after you get off a conversation, off the phone with somebody that you're interested in, both the male and the female. Mm -hmm. Think about how energized and excited you feel. Yeah. And, you, and so think about how creative, how, how you, you have energy to do all this, all this stuff. So it makes complete sense when you actually step out of it and you're like, well, that makes complete sense. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. That's a perfect analogy because when you're getting to know someone or thinking back to when you were um, first getting to know your significant other and how hopeful you were, of things you're going to do and places you're going to go and, you know, that whole, oh, like I'm so happy. That energy, oh my gosh, when directed in the right way is so powerful. And I think also it conversely can be so devastating too, right? And he talks about that. He says, sometimes sex energy, when coupled with some of the other things like jealousy or envy or hatred or whatever, can be detrimental to the individual as well. So um, he says, the emotion of sex has back of it the possibility of three constructive potentialities. They are the per perpetuation of mankind, the maintenance of health as a therapeutic agency, he says it has no equal, and the transformation of mediocrity into genius through the transformation of mediocrity into genius through transmutation. Sex transmutation is simple and easily explained. It means the switching of the mind from thoughts of physical expression to the thoughts of some other nature. Um, the, the 10 mind stimuli is what he talks about next. He says the human mind responds to stimuli through which it may be keyed up to high rates of vibration known as enthusiasm, creative imagination, intense desire. Um, the first listed is the desire for sex expression. The second is love. Third is a burning desire for fame, power, or financial gain, money. The fourth is music. Fifth is friendship between either those of the same sex or those of the opposite sex. Six is a mastermind alliance based upon harmony of two or more people who ally themselves for spiritual or temporal advancement. Seven is mutual suffering such that is experienced by people who are persecuted. Thought that one was very interesting. Eight, auto suggestion, which we've talked about at length through our discussions. Nine is fear, and then 10 is narcotics and alcohol. So the desire for sex expression, he's listed as the top of the list because it's the one that like, like Kia was talking about, gives us that most stepped upness into that energetic, oh my gosh, like we can, I feel something for this person. And so that, that one above all the other things that he, he's listed has that ability to, to kind of amp us up more so than the others. Um, he talks about genius. Um, being developed through the sixth sense. 
And that's the creative imagination. The faculty of creative imagination is one which the majority of people never use during an entire lifetime. That is so sad. I feel like that is so sad. People, when they get stuck in getting up and going to work or they've been you know, taught for, you know, to get, to get a good job, they go get their good job and they go to work and they buy the house and they have the 2.5 kids and picket fence and they just kind of go through life like this. And 40 years later, they retire and they just kind of go through life like this. And they never have that creative explosion. They never have that thing that happens in their mind to let them know, hey, I can actually do this, right? And, and that's kind of sad because unfortunately, um, sometimes people leave and never have, it, have that experience. But thankfully we're reading this book and we won't be one of those people. Hunches, I get them. Does anybody else? get intuitions or hunches of things that they wanna do, like, oh my gosh, and it kind of hits you. Those things are to be paid attention to, right? Those things are not just by happenstance, they, they occur. Those are things that are in your subconscious because they were introduced through some other maybe um, means. But anyway, they ended up in your mind and your mind in your subconscious state developed that idea and it gave you this hunch. Now, what you do with that hunch is going to be dependent upon how in tune you are with your subconscious mind. Sometimes you might get a hunch, and we've all had them. Don't turn down that street. Stop and get gas tonight because just do it, right? Um, uh, let me go down this aisle instead of that aisle. These little things that happen in a day to day, in our day to day thing, these little hunches are really, really powerful because I don't know about you guys, but for me, I, when I don't follow my hunches, I pay for it. One, the other day, my low fuel light was on and I said to myself, just get gas tonight. That way, if something happens tomorrow and this is going on in my head, then you won't be stressed or rushed or whatever. But guess what? I passed by the gas station because I didn't feel like getting out. I didn't feel like pumping the gas. I just wanted to go home, right? So I get home and I knew I had a good 15, 20 miles or whatever. Cause you know, when the low fuel light comes on you still got a little time, right? So I get home the next morning, my son or, uh, or his girlfriend or something, somebody, we need something, somebody needed something. And I remember I was gonna have to stop and get gas before I did that something. And had I not had to stop and get gas, I would have been able to go straight to do whatever it was that needed to be done. And it was something that came out the blue that I wasn't planning on having to do in the first place. That's just an example, right? So when you get these hunches, usually it's your, your subconscious using previous experience. Some of that is that previous experience that you've had in the past to tell you, hey, let's do this the right way this time. Sometimes it comes in the form of red flags when we're meeting somebody and we're out dating and we're talking to somebody or we're not able to carry on a conversation with somebody, but we give them a benefit of the doubt and we're like, okay, well, let's just see where this goes. But we kind of already got the hunch that it probably is not the best pursuit of our time, but for whatever reason, we just kind of go with the flow. And then we find out that our hunch was right, right? So these hunches are very important for us to pay attention to. Dr. Elmer Gates, um, he had this practice that he did, right? He was one that came up with a lot of patents and he had this room and he would go into the room and he had a button on this desk or wherever it was close by and he would turn off all the lights and he would close his eyes and he would think because in that state of darkness and quiet, he was able to really think about what it is he needed to think about. And that's where a lot of his ideas and, 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 and things came from was when he got into that space of being able to just completely focus on those thoughts, right? Has anybody had experiences like that where you um, received a revelation of something or got an answer to something when you got really quiet and just kind of shut everything out that you'd like to share? So my um, hunches and all of that comes through prayer. Mm. And usually um, it's when I get up and pray when he wakes me up, whether it be two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Mm. and you know, in prayer, he's actually shown me how to do things. He's actually shown me where, like, I threw something away that I needed, and I, of course, I forgot about it, and when I prayed, he brought it back to my remembrance and told me, go back and look in the trash can. That's where it is. Oh, girl. And that ideas, is I mean, seriously, I could be sitting 
for example, I'll give you an example. Um, in terms of the notary piece, remember I told you I became a notary because of my job. So I was I was thinking about moving, and I told you this before, and I was like, well, what if I move and I don't find, get a job that pays as much, could be the same job, but they just don't pay what I make in Nashville. And he dropped in on me, you're a notary. This is before I met you, this is before anything. Wow. And so I was like, okay, Lord, show me what to do. Now I've known Quentin, I've realized that you've known Quentin for longer than I have, but Quentin and I, so I play the organ, I haven't played in like a year since COVID. That's how I met Quentin. Quentin plays the drums. Yeah. And so Quentin, random conversation, Quentin just started telling me what he was doing in terms of notary because, you know, he quit his job. Right. And full time in LSA, you know. And so it just kind of all started coming together. He connected me with you. And so the Lord just opened up a lot of different areas, but it, it came through prayer. Well, so. he do it. Yeah. And here's the thing the author talks about, and that's a perfect segue, Kia. Thanks for sharing. He, it, the author talks about prayer in the in the chapter that we read and he says most people pray when they're full of fear okay when they've already tried everything else out now they want to pray right but he says and he reminds us and we all know that we praying folks know that if you're praying for a thing and you and it's coupled with fear and doubt then it's not it's it's not a pray it's it's in vain you know because that one, that act of praying has to come with it faith in order for it to, to work. So he it's, it's interesting that you say that and that that's one of the things he talks about in the book is that most people do, and I've been most people, oh Lord, what am I gonna do? Lord, what am I, and, and this is after a series of me doing all this other stuff and that not working. Now I wanna get down on my knees and pray about it. But by that time, I'm so scared about whatever it is that the prayer is not as effective as it would be had I just been praying for that thing and believing it to happen all the whole while, right? So I got to share one more thing with you. So I'm out of town right now and I told you, right? And so I, I, I walk quite a bit and I've been walking just around the neighborhood here. So um, I was in the bed and I don't, where I'm staying is not too far from Little Strip Mall. And so this, we'll call it a hunch. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason. So I was laying in the bed and I'm like, mm, I got to go to Walmart. And so the hunch was, why don't you just walk to Walmart? This was the hunch. Okay. And I'm like, I could do that. And I'm like, but what if it's too far? Mm. So I'm still laying in bed and I still get this hunch. Really, it's God, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm going to walk to Walmart, right? And if it's too far, I'll turn around and I'll come back home and I'll get my car. So I head out to Walmart and guess what? What? There was a shortcut. Now, God knew all along there was a shortcut. But I didn't know there was a shortcut. Uh, I understand my point. So if I would have never gotten up and stepped out on what he said to go do, I would have missed it. Yes, that I love that. I love he's that's the cool thing about when you do start developing your relationship with God is that he will prove himself. He's like, look, just trust what I got. Look, I try every every little and it could be something so little like that. Like, oh, you knew there was a shortcut. I and know. he has such a sense of humor too. That's funny. Yes, definitely, <laughs> yeah. definitely. I love it. Um, okay, so let's hear. Good morning, Zara. Welcome to the discussion. I'm so glad to see you here. Morning, morning. <laughs> so we're talking about Mr. Edison now. Mr. Edison and these people back in the day. You guys, they didn't have Google. They didn't have. They didn't have the card catalog. I don't even think was out back then. So the fact that these people of industry and of great, you know, development and all these different things, the fact that they did things 10,000 times like he did, he says, Mr. Edison tried out more than 10,000 different combinations of ideas through the synthetic faculty of his imagination before he tuned into the creative faculty. The synthetic faculty of your imagination is based on things that you have experienced. I know that this is a, a water bottle and I know that if I heat it up, it's probably gonna melt. That's an experiential type of faculty that's in my, it's stored in my brain. I know it for a fact, right? That creative faculty though, is that it's, it, it, it doesn't rely on your experiences, right? It comes from woof. And if it doesn't, then we don't progress as mankind because Edison had already tried 10 different, 10,000 different combinations of ideas based on that that he knew and had been exposed to. 
but it wasn't until that he tuned in to that higher level of thinking that he was able to come up with the incandescent light. Because if he had relied solely on what had been and what he knew and what had been accomplished up until that point, we, we wouldn't have, okay? So he had to, he had to step outside. This lighting is really good. I really, no, let me stop. He had to step outside of that creative, that, it, of that, what he knew in order to get to that creative so he could learn something else and, and like the whole uh, outer space. You know, for the longest people thought that the spaces between the planets was just this void nothingness. Now they know that's not the case, right? Because of why? Faith. Somebody said, hey, I think we can shoot a man in a metal tube out of the Earth's atmosphere into the void and that he'll be okay. I'm not signing up for that, okay? But somebody had enough faith to think that that was possible. Faith, by definition, is the evidence, is the, is the belief that something is real when you don't see it, right? It's, it's okay, I know that there's something there, but you can't physically touch it or feel it or whatever. You're just going on faith. So they had faith that they could do that. And guess what? They were right. And that faith led to other faith that, hey, maybe we can go sit on Mars. And maybe we can go to the moon and maybe we can do all these other things. And so here we are with all of this faith that has proven itself to be true that, hey, now we know that the mind is our limitation. And we, if we can go and access that creative aspect of our mind, there's no telling what we could find out. Um, the human mind responds to stimulation, people. If you're not in an area of your life where you're stimulating your mind and you're in this humdrum just, you know, nothing's, nothing's happening kind of deal, it's not gonna stimulate your mind. You have to stimulate your mind through reading, through the right music, through surrounding yourself with the right people. Um, your five senses of sight, smell, um, sound, hearing, touch, all these things, you have to really make sure that they are, the inputs there are conducive to, to your goals of being wealthy, right? If they're not, like we talked about in the last um, discussion, I like gangster rap. I love, I've always listened to gangster rap. And I've noticed here as of late, I've been getting a hunch that maybe those words and those lyrics and those beats and those things like that, they're all cool and nice, but maybe some of the things that are, are in them are counterproductive to where you're going. And so I'm, 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 I'm fine with that. I'm like, okay, well, you know what? Gangster rap ain't that important to me. What's more important to me is achieving this wealth so I can build a legacy for my family and create this community, agricultural community that I want to develop one day. Those things are more important to me than gangster rap. So I have began to tune down some of that so that I can allow my senses to come in with more positive stuff that will, you know, propel me on to where I want to go. So we have to make conscious decisions and then have the discipline for those decisions to be carried out. So in the case of some of our friends and family, we know that there are some people who, when we get around them, aren't conducive to our, but we, because they're family or because they're this, we just keep, or because we're out of habit, right? We just keep those things around. Well, this is, this is where this mastermind that we're having here is where the rubber meets the road. If you say you want success and wealth, then you have to make some hard decisions and start to kind of peel some of those things out of your life that aren't conducive to that success and wealth. And you know what they are. And for me, it also keeps coming to me on the health. Zara, did you want to chime in? Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I'm listening. I apologize. Okay. No, no problem. I just saw the, the thing light up around your name and I didn't know if you had something. But for me, another one of those things is health and exercise. You know, I had two hot dogs and a bag of Lay's chips yesterday. Okay. I knew when I got those two hot dogs out the fridge, we had put them on the barbecue the other day before and I heated them. They were good and burnt too. You know how a good barbecue hot dog is, right? I knew that those two hot dogs, the hot dog buns and the glass of sweet tea and the Lay's potato chips were not conducive to my health. But it tastes good though. But it was fine. <laughs> okay. 
but I tore them up. Okay. And, but what's happening though is, and you know, cause I made some steps, you know, I've, 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 I've joined the gym, right. I went twice, right. I found, I found. Okay? And I, and that was a month ago. Right. But it <laughs> took me 12 months to join the gym. So things sometimes can start slowly, but they're coming to, to my awareness more often. And I'm having to be honest with myself. Right. I have a half a mile between my driveway and the dead end. If I walk one way, it's half a mile. If I walk back, it's a half a mile. So every day, very easily, I could walk a mile without any hassle, right? Last week, week before, I was doing that, doing some weights. So what I noticed what's happening with me is my conscious mind is starting to be aware of what my subconscious mind is telling it with regard to my conversation about my health. And it's like, I, I don't know if it's because of this book that those two connections are starting to be made, but I'm being more accountable with myself as a result of it. So once you start to get in tune with really what you want and you know those things that are prohibiting you from getting there, you don't have anybody else but yourself to blame because you start to realize when you are sabotaging yourself, it's nobody else, right? Nobody's gonna make me drink water. Normally what I, what normally what I would have this morning is a cup of coffee, okay? I wouldn't have this normally, but slowly and surely because I'm reading this book and I'm becoming more accountable with those things, the decisions that, that I make, it's, it's now, let me just drink the water, okay? So these things are, are happening slowly and gradually with me from the music to the being aware of what I'm putting in my body. And I did have a win. I was, when I was shopping at Walmart for the hot dogs and getting all the stuff that I wanted for that, I passed by the family pack of the Rice Krispie Treats. And I said, OMG. that would be great. And it was like a 36 pack, right? But I knew because why I am starting to have these conversations with myself, although not perfect yet, I left the, and, and, I, and then I said, the kids would love these. That's the worst, right? The moms, you guys know, oh, I'll get these for the kids, okay? They could put them in their lunch. No, I had a two minute conversation or 30 seconds, however long it took me to walk past that end cap with all those Rice Krispie treats. And I said, no, I do not need those Rice Krispie treats. So I left the Rice Krispie treats. Still got the hot dogs, right? But I didn't get the Rice Krispie treats too. So, you know, you have to pay attention to yourself and make when you're making these decisions and, and, and pat yourself on the back when you achieve an accomplishment, even though you weren't perfect, right? Anybody else have an example like that that they'd like to share? Of you recognizing what your sub, your, your view recognizing that your conscious mind is now becoming aware of what your subconscious mind wants. My subconscious mind is starting to want health, right? Because I'm think, I'm starting to tell myself I deserve health. And for the longest time, I've been telling myself I didn't, it didn't matter, or I didn't care or whatever, but now I'm starting to care. So I'm, see, I'm starting to feed that conversation to my mind. Through what? The power of auto-suggestion. And so it's slowly starting to manifest itself in the conscious mind where I'm making decisions, all be they small, that I can tell it's starting to work. Auto-suggestion works. So whatever you have to start to tell yourself, just know that you may not see it happen right away, but you'll start to recognize little bits and, and pieces of it. Um, okay, so let's move on. Men seldom succeed before the age of 40. And I would say women too. Um, hey, I don't know. Uh, I have uh, just reached my mid forties. When I turned 40, I was very much so entering into a space of I'm not caring what people thought. I am full there now. Um, I very, very rarely let anybody's opinions of me dictate what I do and don't do in life and business. If I did, I wouldn't have all of the things going that I have now Could be because I've got the notary, I've got the farm, I've got the real estate. I, at one point in my life, would have been afraid to do that because people would have said, oh, Monica, you're, you're, you're scatterbrained. You're all over the place. You're doing too much. You need to focus on one thing and a jack of all trades and a master of none. And all of those things would have prohibited me from adding anything to my plate, right? Because of what, why? Other people's thoughts. Now I don't give a damn. 
Okay. I don't care what nobody thinks. Okay. I'm going to do what I feel I need to do in order to get me where I need to get. Right. And that includes the things that I have going on, but that didn't happen in my thirties. Something is significant about your forties. I don't know if it's just because it's the middle part of your life and you have enough time to look back and see how much BS you've been taught. Right. And how much of it was wrong. And now you're at a place where you're picking out the, the stuff that you know to be true and you're leaving the stuff that you know to be false. And so now that gives you a new set of realities to look at. And now you're just like, you realize that all of our crap stinks and we all put our pants on one leg at a time and there's no one of us that's any better than the other. And then maybe for the first part of your life, you thought maybe that was different and that you were here in the hierarchy of life, but that there were other people that were here, here and here and you fit in somewhere here. But in your 40s, you realize, no, we're all here. And some people have done a good job of getting you to think that they're here and you're here because they've been able to get you to believe that. But once you get control of your own thinking, you realize, no, buddy, we're all here, okay? Um, you know, I don't care what school you went to, I don't care what you look like, I don't care the color of your skin, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care how skinny or muscular, or none of that matters because we are all here, right? You may have you know, way more material things than me, or maybe you've got more degrees than me, or maybe whatever, right? None of that makes you here and me here. That happens in your 40s. In your 40s, for, for most of us, and when you get there, you'll, you'll be able to either confirm or deny this statement. Most of us in our 40s have the, start having that revelation that, okay, here's, everybody's here, okay? Even though for the last 20 years, 30 years, I've been thinking otherwise, this is the reality of it. Now, because I know that we're all here, hmm, the playing field has been leveled. So that means that those things I've been looking at you as having as success, because you've got the big house and the big car, I can have those too. So now I just have to figure out how I want those things, right? Even though I know those things don't define me, I just want them and that's fine. But I didn't think I could have them because in my mind, I was here. But now that I know that I'm here, because the 40s have helped you see, I'm just rambling, but my point is, your 40s are magical. And apparently it gets better in your 50s and your 60s, because you become less and less reliant upon what other people feel, think, and want for you. And you become more dependent on what you want and think and feel for yourself. Uh, anybody have any, any 40s examples that you'd like to, to share with the group? Well, no 40s examples, um, because I'm not in my 40s yet, but I think that environment uh, should reduce that age. So my daughter is 18. <laughs> I don't want her to wait till uh, 40 to get the revelation. I'm, in, I'm, I'm about to be in my mid 30s and I, I'm catching the revelation now. So I hope that, you know, just being in the mix of you and other leaders that I uh, admire and respect, that I'll take the words of wisdom and run with it. And then also to your point of the, the uh, comment of a jack of all trades, a master of none, but everyone always stops at that saying, but they don't finish the complete sentence because it says a master of all trade, uh, a master of none, but oftentimes better than one. Mm, you know what? So, I've never heard that. I never have heard that tail end of that. So there's more to that phrase then. Yeah, it is. It's more, it's a complete sentence. So it says a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than one. <laughs> so you need to diversify your portfolio because if one hangs up, like my mom, if my mom been on her job 25 years and now she can't work because of age or they say they disqualify her layer off because of her age, then what else you gonna do? So you can't just go up. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. I love that. And I love how you're thinking already in terms of your daughter getting that revelation at such a young age. And I think by you, being of the mindset that you are, Zara, I think that actually is going to happen because she's going to be surrounded with your mindset and your thinking. And she's going to, she's already seeing the fruits of it, you know, from her being on notarized, she's gotten her notary commission. And I don't know very many 18 year olds that are that forward thinking, right? That entrepreneurial and the boards that you guys have, it's going to be difficult for her not to get that revelation earlier than 40. Yeah, right? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for You're that. Welcome. Thank you for sharing that. Man's greatest motivating force is his desire to please woman. Would you guys agree? Touche. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, it says, take women out of their lives and great wealth will be useless to most men. In this, it is this inherent desire of a man to please women, which gives women the power to make or break man. Um, behind every great man, they say, is a strong or a great woman. And we've seen that exhibited throughout history. He gives us some examples of things like that. But the thing that makes that true is the power of love. Love is the greatest powerful force in these here universe streets. So true. <laughs> it's more powerful than anything. There is nothing that can't, that can't be accomplished without love. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. All things can be accomplished with love. Let me put it that way. If without love, you can't do anything. If you weren't loved, right, you wouldn't be here, right? Someone loved you, okay? Someone loved you, brought you into this world, nurtured you, showed you what love looked like. Maybe a whole bunch of people showed you love, right? You might have had some few, a few handful of experiences where, you know, people didn't show you love, but that didn't overcome or take away the love that you had already experienced, right? So the fact that you had already experienced love didn't take away the benefit that that love gave you. You were still able to continue to move on when you ran into the, the non-love, right? So having love in the center of it, me, and it really honestly starts with you loving yourself. And I think a lot of us maybe struggle with that because if you don't really have that true love for yourself, then you won't really believe that you deserve some of these things that we're talking about in the book, right? And Loving yourself mean, means, means a lot of different things, but if you truly love yourself, you won't do bad things to yourself, right? You won't do bad things to yourself. You won't put bad things in your body. You won't be mean to yourself by calling yourself ugly or fat every time you look in the mirror. You won't talk, you, you won't talk, you won't say bad things to yourself. Like um, imagine the person that you love, this, when you hear the word love and you think of somebody that you love, right? Put that image in your mind of that person. Now imagine you saying bad things to them. You're ugly. You're you're you you are you're never gonna be anything. You you don't have you can't you're stupid. Could you imagine saying things like that to someone who you loved? That person that you have in your image in your I couldn't because I'm thinking of my kids. I would I would never say those things to them. Not 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 in a right mind, right? So, so it's important that we realize that we ourselves sometimes have conversations with ourselves that aren't loving. And we need to make sure that we are having loving conversations with ourselves and not only having loving conversations, but doing loving actions to ourselves. So we all have been in those, you know, groups or seen posts or self-love day or self-love. Let's go around the room real quick and give examples of ways that you can show yourself love. Uh, let's start with Vanessa. What is a way that you have in the past or currently show yourself love, Vanessa? All right, let's go to Hilda. Um, with me, I currently just have um, separate myself to have time to sit down and if I'm going to read the book or if I'm going to even by just organizing a part of the house mm -hmm. it, and that's that's having to do something and just spending time with my my pets and my children are grown I have a 23 and a 21 so uh -huh. um, the way I, I spend my time for myself is just by just going outside for a little bit with the plants and I oh, love it just, uh, just easy stuff yeah I love it you and me are similar in that regard I am so excited about the spring I love cultivating there's something about having my hands in the dirt and even being outside and just bare feet and being amongst like plants <laughs> and seeing them grow it's so oh my gosh it's so soothing to my soul so I totally get that I love that thank you for sharing that with us um, Candace, okay. how about you? What examples do you uh, have? All right. So a little, a um, couple of months ago, I started doing what um, is called mirror work. 
And every time I look in the mirror, I speak um, the things that I like. I see the things that I like in myself and I speak it out. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I think I shared last week that, you know, I'm going through a month on the tail end of a divorce. So that within itself, um, I, I recognize that it did something to my confidence, you know, where I used to be very confident. I mean, I could, I, I previously I could walk into a room and tilt it easily, but then I started to notice and recognize that instead of me tilting the room, I'm hiding. Mm. And, you know, due to being in a marriage um, with narcissism involved, I did not realize what it had done to me mentally. So lots of canceling um, and just getting back to myself. So when I look in that mirror, rather than pointing out things that I would like to change, I point out every single thing um, that I like and that I see. And I'll give you guys, and it, it works. I'll give you an example. Um, I had gained 18 pounds. The <laughs> This is divorce weight. And every time I walked in, the, in front of a mirror, I'd notice those 18 pounds. My goodness, I've gained 18 pounds. And I was working out. I started riding my bike um, last summer twice a day. Um, I, and, and I not eat pretty well, but I knew that that weight was probably from depression. And so every time I looked in the mirror, I said to myself that I was tiny. Now I'm 5'11", you guys, I'm a tall woman. But I said to myself, I'm tiny. Oh, I look so small today. And I kid you not, it was not until I saw myself in the mirror the way I wanted to see myself when I spoke those words out, that weight dropped off of me. I'm and it was not until I had been exercising all along. But when I looked in that mirror and saw myself the way that I wanted to see it, that scale follows suit. So, I, you know, mirror work is a lot. It's one of my favorite things to do when I wake up in the morning. I'm looking in that mirror and I'm saying every, every single thing that I like about myself, I'm highlighting that. And that's how I start my day. Of, that's how I start my day, of course, after prayer. <laughs> love that mirror work that's amazing yes mm -hmm. counseling too is another way to show self-love and I, I love that you've done that too that's so so powerful how about you kia well mine is similar to candace i have a list of affirmations that i started saying every day and candace i'm also divorced my divorce um i wasn't married very long actually in my uh, marriage he was uh, mentally and emotionally abusive so that's another story for another time but um so yeah, I have a list of affirmations that I say daily, at least I try to do it daily. And anybody that might be suffering from a bad um, body self image, I go back to the mirror example that Candace gave, look in the mirror and actually look at yourself. Because a lot of times when you look at things in social media, in the media in general, it makes you have this picture of how the perfect woman is supposed to look. But what you don't think about is um, she's got on all this makeup. She might have fake hair, fake boobs, fake body parts. It's not the real woman. And she may not even be that skinny. It's like an image to kind of trick you to make, make her look a certain way. True. And it's, it's a lot about the head game, what's in your head. So that's, that's what I do. And it's another thing that I do. So I love to cook, as I told Monica, and I love to make pretty pictures. I like to make my food pretty. So that's really more so about me. And I'm, I'm doing the healthy thing and exercising and that's just personal for me just trying to stay healthy because when you get past a certain age when you get in your 40s your body starts doing a lot of different things and you kind of lose control your metabolism does a lot of different things but you can you can flip that you can flip right. it with diet and exercise so that's my story love it thank you for sharing narisa what are some self-love things that you've been doing lately I love being outside, but outside is not loving me being out there right now. So I'm suffering with uh, allergies and that stuff, but I enjoy just sitting on my porch rocking. Yes. Oh, I am a poor. I, if I did not have my front porch, I do not know what I would do with life. Love that. How about you, Lori? Hi. Um, like Candace, I recently started doing mirror work. So it's good to hear that it actually works. Um, one thing I realized, like I have never been one to um, do anything for myself. You know, I do for other people, I do for this person or that person. But when it came to me, I didn't do anything. And as you get older, older than 40, older than 50, stuff starts happening to your body where you're like, when did that happen? And, you know, 
you start to stay away from looking in the mirror. Well, I did start to stay away from looking in the mirror. So when I was told about this mirror work, I like looked at it from the side, almost like as if I was peeping because it was just <laughs> uncomfortable to me. And so, you know, little by little, my confidence grew and I was able to actually stand and look at my eyes and say to myself that I was beautiful, you're beautiful, that we're beautiful. And, you know, it really, it, it really makes me feel better. So that, that's like the beginning of my stages of, of doing things for myself. That is awesome. Thank you very much for sharing. You guys have got me. I'll be researching mirror work here after we get off this call. How about you, Zara? What are some things that you're doing to show yourself love? Uh, for me in this season, uh, I, I follow this formula called the savers. So for me, savers in the morning, uh, I wake up and I'm silent for a little bit, just spend time in my thoughts and prayer. Then I do affirmation, visualization, and I'm supposed, the E is for exercise, but instead of me doing the E for exercise, y'all, because I'm not there, I'm just stretching and doing a little yoga, okay, because I'm not there yet, or I just do a little uh, uh, walk, and then I read, and I like to write now. I wasn't writing before. I put that down, and then I started to pick up my writing, so I try to do uh, my savers, and then I love, I'm like uh, Kia, where I like to I have, I cook here and there, but when I do cook, I like to make my food fancy, but when I'm not cooking, I like to eat at a nice restaurant. Y'all love eating. Y'all can't help it. (laughs) I can't help it. But, and I'm also, the last thing I'm doing is allowing my, my no to be no and my yes to be yes. And I'm not sacrificing my well being for other people and not feeling bad about it. Oh, I love that last one, Zara. You are a girl. You are, I wish I had that mindset when I was your age. Oh my goodness. I would have saved myself so much heartache. But yes, those are, thank you very much for sharing. Those are all really good ways to show yourself love. And you are exercising, don't? That E is for exercise, yoga and walking. They're, they're just not strenuous, but don't, you know, don't take away from them being forms of exercise because they are. So I think you're thank doing you. great. So Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Damien, how about you? In this room full of women. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't, I must say, I don't know. I don't, I don't do any mirror work. I don't intentionally do any mirror work, but I mean, um, I guess I'm always, you know, I guess I'm always kind of making sure, um, I protect, you know, people call it protecting their energy and all that stuff. I protect my, my, my sanity and stuff. I think that's the, probably the, I don't know, the most intentional I do, I think for self-care is just, you know, mind and who I'm around, what type of relationships I'm forming, right? Um, you know, who I'm allowing myself to connect to. Mm. Um, That's important. Things, you know, weeding out the moochers, weeding out the, the leeches type of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably the most intentional I think I do for self-care, just protecting myself and and stuff like that. Love that. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, me personally, these frames are an example of self-care. When I, uh, about four months ago, I think is when I got them. And for the longest, I had been using the readers at Walgreens. And I said to myself, you know, I'll just spend 12, 13, $14 and get me some readers. And, and they were working or whatever the case may be. But one day I said, you know what? I need some glasses. I need glasses. So I'm going to go to the eye place and I know it's going to probably be expensive, but guess what? I'm worth it. So I went and spent $300 on the exam and the, and the frames and that money, I didn't want to spend on that. I could have thought of a whole bunch of different things to do with that money. Right. And I didn't like a lot of us, I think Hilda might, might've mentioned it, not wanting to spend so much on yourself so much, but that day when I swipe my card, and then I had my glasses. I was like, and I got so many compliments. Oh, those look great on you. And it just made me feel good. And then on top of that, I could see, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's one way that I have is, is put self-care up in front is to make sure I have my doctor's appointments and my, I take care of my eyes and kind of know what's going on with my health. I still haven't gotten with the dentist yet because that's my, last, my, my next thing. I've got to schedule a dentist appointment and get all that taken care of. But That's kind of my self-care as of late has been making sure that my my health appointments have been kept and met and that I'm doing what they tell me that I need to do as best I can. So, all right. So let's talk about these. Thank you guys for sharing all that. Let's talk real quick 
about the seven major positive emotions and then the seven major negative emotions. He talks about this on my page 189. The seven major positive emotions are desire, faith, love, sex, enthusiasm, romance, and hope. And the seven major negative emotions, which are to be avoided, are fear, jealousy, hatred, revenge, greed, superstition, and anger, okay? Um, I definitely have struggled with fear, not so much the jealousy, but definitely some revenge has crept in from time to time. I'm not as bad as that as I was in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> I've grown a lot, right? Um, superstition, I still suffer from a little bit of that. We talked about that a little bit last time. I just now start stopped splitting the poll. But when I look at the time and it's 444 or 555, sometimes that superstition stuff still comes in. Um, it's your responsibility, he says, to make sure that positive emotions constitute the dominating influence of your mind, okay? You are the controller of what goes into your mind and apparently your mind has 10 million different little sensors and all these different things that are wired and mapped accordingly and what you give it, it will take. And so you have to be intentional about what you give it. And this is, this is, this is the whole thing about this book, Thinking and Growing Rich, right? It's, it's a process and it comes with a whole bunch of little steps that must be taken in order for you to convince yourself that you're gonna be able to ac accomplish this goal. Um, so we already talked about prayer and we talked about that. So let's go on to chapter 13 and this will be the last one before we um, conclude. Uh, the brain is a broadcasting and receiving station for thought. Uh, the 12th, 12th step towards riches. More than 20 years ago, the author working in conjunction with the late Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, Dr. Elmer Gates, uh, and, Dr. and Dr. Elman Gates observed that every human brain is both a broadcasting and a receiving station for the, for the vibration of thought. So we, in connection with one another, are constantly exchanging whether we know it or not. Some people are so good at it, they can, it's called tele telepathy. They did a study, and this study showed that there were some people who are able, with this deck of cards that they had in this study, to determine the exact right card more more times than not and it was you know there was no explanation as to why they were able to do this and this this experiment occurred both right there in the same room and then when they were far apart there are some people whose brains allow for them to read somebody's thoughts right and i'm not one of those people right but apparently there are people who can do that and they have to be intentional about it but the, the fact of the matter is we don't really fully understand that ability but there's been enough scientific evidence to show that this is a pop this phenomenon this phenomena is a reality for some people so your brain is so so i don't think we will ever understand until we're gone how powerful our brains are um the, the dramatic story of the brain at the bottom of 195 uh, last but not least, man, with all of its, his boasted culture and education, understands little or nothing of the intangible force, the great law of intangibles of thought. Um, he knows but little concerning the physical brain and its vast network of intricate machinery through which the power of thought is translated into its material equivalent. We have got to understand that our brains, if we train them, can help us achieve every one of the goals that we set out for ourselves in our electronic vision boards, plus plus more. I think we don't even realize the magnitude of what we can accomplish if we actually give our brains, kind of like a farmer feeds his crop fertilizer, whatever we fertilize our brains with, whatever thoughts first that we allow into our brains, and then whatever material that we use to fertilize those thoughts are going to be powerful in helping us get to where we're going to get to or keeping us from where we're going to go. Um, back to my gangster rap example if i continue to allow that to fertilize my thoughts right then you know there's aspects of it that are good because for me gangster rap is like powerful and i can do it you can't stop me and da la la so it does give me that but on the other side there's some things that kind of you know the you know kind of feed that negative stuff right so now because i'm reading and i'm being aware of this my con I'm, t I'm telling my conscious mind, okay, Monica, just listen to this, put it on YouTube, do this, do that, feed yourself something else. 
So you have to feed your brain the things that you are going to want, that, are, that it's going to need, that fertilizer it's going to need in order to propel you and grow you in that area. If you don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for you. And then you're going to end up in that stream of that river flow down to poverty and then wake up wondering, why are you with these people? Why are we all, and why am I, why am I in this sea of mediocrity here right now? Because you didn't extract yourself by being intentional about feeding and fertilizing your brain those things that it needed in order to go to the, to the other direction. Um, anybody else have anything that came out of chapter 13 that you'd like to share? Miss Candace just put something. I'm not, I think Miss Candace just said something, but I don't. Let's see here. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So I, I put you. I put you a little bump in the the chat box. I love it. I listen to I, that in the morning too. Okay. Cool. <laughs> It'll replace your gangster rap. Thank you. See, I need the bass. Okay. So you, I appreciate you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that out. Thank you very much. Let me put it in the. Let me actually go ahead and click on it so I can save it on my. And app. then while you're doing that, so I'm noticing with the book, everything has to do with intentionality and feeding your mind or feeding your mind with positive you know, information. Mm -hmm. However, I feel like, not I feel like, I know that we all have traumas that we have to overcome and we're forever healing. So in my mind, I'm like, well, Zara, will, do we all ever heal completely? Um, I don't know if we completely heal, but I think that we can evolve from the pain. So I'm trying to figure out with Think and Grow Rich, you know, with it being intentional, it's inspiring me to want to go address my mental health issues, but I'm telling myself, well, what did they do back in the day? Because there weren't there. I mean, wow, well, I'd be mistaken, but I don't feel like the trauma back then compares or the trauma now compares to then. So how did mama and grandma and them, how did they heal them? Like, I just trying to figure out even with Napoleon Hill, you come from such, you know, slum and then you're able to overcome with all the trauma. And it's like, where's, I guess, should I be asking the how? or just figure it out as time goes on? I think, that make no, I totally get what you're asking is, you know, how do you, how did they overcome their traumas? What tools mm -hmm. they utilize in order to mm -hmm. overcome their traumas? And I, when you were talking, when I thought about my grandmother and, and my great grandmother, it was spirituality. It really was the main thing that they went to in order to uh, overcome whatever they were negatives they, they were experiencing in their day. -day obstacles. Life. Okay. Not, right. Um, you know, and I have a lot of people in my family that use alcohol um, to, to, to do that. And then and, and, and the results of that were devastating, you know? So people use different things to cope with the traumas that they experience and their environmental factors that are, you know, that they've been a part of. Some of those choices that they use to cope are good and some are bad. And, and we can look back at those and say, hey, because now we have, you know, it's more okay to get to a counselor or talk to somebody and, you know, all these different things are out there. Um, but I keep hearing things like exercise. I keep th hearing things like mm. diet. Um, um, and, I, and I didn't realize how important those things were to your overall mental health. But apparently some of the, the foods that we're eating, which is why I'm so passionate about the farm space, some of the foods that we're eating are riddled with some chemicals. And sometimes when those chemicals get in our body, they react um, in a certain way with our physiology and can mm. impact depression and things like that. So, you know, there's still a whole lot left out there to be discovered with regard to the relationship of the foods that we eat and the things that our body recognizes as good and, and not good because our body is one big hormone, right? We're just all, mm -hmm. we've got all these things going on. So some people do handle and cope with food. And, and so, so those things can, you know, if you're eating the food and it's got the chemicals and those chemicals are, 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 are not acting right. So all of these successful people that I'm hearing and talk, hearing talk about things that they've done in order to, tools that they're using in order to help with their mental health, it starts with exercise, fresh air, water, being hydrated, and their diet and okay. care and meditation. Those those are the common themes that I'm seeing to people who really want to make a difference and in, in, in their, in their overall um, quality of life. It starts with there and then nobody can do those things for you, but it does help. I heard to also, you know, go and speak with people. So, you know, I've told myself like right now, the insurance I have, I'm not going to be able to get the kind of, um, you know, me uh, mental health professional that I want. I want the best I want, I want to go back to childhood and I want this person to be super good at it 
So I need to get wealthy so I can spend six months on the couch going through all the junk, right? Getting all that out of the way, right? So a part, a part of that is knowing that that's what I need, but until I can get to that place and using these other tools to help me get there, you know, the that was good. The walking and stuff like that. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. You guys, that's basically it. I mean, we've kind of hit it in the head. Um, we're going to wait and leave chapters 14 and 15, the last two chapters of the book to next Saturday. They are pretty heavy. I had hoped for us to do them this week, but in, and to, to finish the book this week, but I didn't get these two read. But the last chapter, How to Outwit the Six Ghosts of Fear, is was worth having its own day anyway. So I'm looking forward to, to discussing both chapter 14, The Sixth Sense, and chapter 15, How to Outwit the Six, so six Ghosts of Fear um, on next Saturday. Um, is there anybody that has anything else before we conclude for, for today? No, I just want to say thank you. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Key. Uh, my question was just that um, there's, it's one more, it's chapter 16 is the last chapter. Did you want us to finish? Oh, chapter wait a minute. Just I wait. thought that there was only 15 chapters. Hold on. It goes to 16. It's not very long. Okay, so yeah, 16. Yeah, let's do, let, we're going to finish it out next week. These last three chapters for next week. My bad, you guys. Yeah, let's do it. Let's finish out next Saturday will be the end of the um, Think and Grow Rich book. And, and then what's our new book coming up? So we I can... was just about to say, I don't know what we're going to read oh. next time. What are you guys thinking? Anything? You know what? My book doesn't have a chapter 16. My book, I'm sitting here flipping through it like, did I miss that? But it, this, it goes from, it's the last... Is my last chapter is the six how to outwit the six ghosts of fear, but this is a different edition, so we're probably getting the same content. They just chap they made it into different um thing, yeah. But mine is so, so this chapter says the devil's workshop that's chapter 16. Oh, I don't have chapter 16 then. Wow, okay, so I wonder we're gonna have to compare notes on that to see if this is probably incorporated in, um, in my 15 or not, but anyway, we're gonna finish up the book. Um, somebody had a question. What was that? I just, I missed it. What's the next book? That's what I was asking. Um, what's the next book? Hmm. What does anybody, does anybody have an idea of, a book? I, I'm, I'm at a loss right now and I almost want to take a little bit of a break, um, just to kind of put things into perspective I think I, I think I need some time because we've been kind of hitting books hard and I think now after having read you know we read the LinkedIn I haven't really put all of that into play I'm still making those types of changes we, we read best practices and now we've read this those are some heavy hitters and I think sure. we probably should instead of jumping into an, another book maybe we should use our Saturday mornings for maybe a couple of Saturdays at least as a form of maybe accountability Maybe. That's awesome. Yes. That sounds awesome. Yes, that sounds awesome. Okay, good. You're correct. Like, Think and Grow Rich was heavy. Like, I still haven't even <laughs> sat on that. <laughs> yeah, correct. I think I need to, because there's a self-analysis at the end of the book that he is, is a bunch of questions. And I think maybe uh, after we finish the book next Saturday, maybe that following Saturday, we can kind of go back and pull out those things that we were supposed to have done in the chapter and be accountable with one another and getting those done. Like in chapter two, he told us to do some stuff. Chapter four, he told us to do some stuff. You know, chapter six, he told us to do some stuff. And if you guys are like me, you thought about doing them, but you really didn't do them. Um, and so maybe we use some of these Saturdays here in the next couple of weeks as getting those things done before we hop into that next book. Are you guys cool with that? Oh, that's, I'm here for it. Okay, cool. that's yeah. what we'll do then. All right, so we'll finish the book up 14 through 16 next week on Saturday morning. I will see you guys there. And in between then and now, take care of yourself. Love yourself. Train your brains, okay? You guys have a great Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a great week. Bye-bye.